Okay, uh, this is Thinking Cloud Native, Cloud Events Future. It's the serverless, uh, or the CNCF serverless working group update, um, mostly focused around cloud events. So if you're in the wrong spot, it's a long walk. Uh, I thought I'd give a quick TLDR of how we got here, and then I'll move on to something completely different than we've done in other working group updates. Uh, it's super quick. You know, we, we as a group, the community, wrote a white paper in 2018, started in 2017, and the result of that was uh, things like this uh, CNCF serverless landscape box that has been updated, and uh, in 2019, one of the results of that paper was it's really difficult to use serverless because there's no standard definition of how events get to functions. So to try to address that, the cloud event spec was created and we'll go into more detail right now. So this is the serverless landscape that was originally created. Um, it was a bunch of research through uh, uh, a lot of people in the CNCF community and uh, Redpoint. And of course, it's evolved a lot since uh, four or five years from then. In fact, there's not a lot of similar pictures on this fiction. It's, 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 it's crazy um, and really great. And uh, you know, now we have cloud events here, and that's what we're here to talk about. But of course, we are trying to do all of this uh, cloud native compute technology because we want to be able to take these projects and assemble them into some very complex system. And one of the, one of the things that the CNCF is trying to promise is that these things come off the shelf, they wire together, and you can get up and going with very, very little fr friction. And so we started looking around, and you know, I'm going to show you a couple examples of excellent projects. And I just noticed a little something that was reoccurring. And that's that they, almost every project has uh, either the ability to consume an event or, or the ability to produce an event. So Prometheus has this uh, alert manager. And I'm not, I'm not totally sure what's in that box. But you know, if we zoom in, uh, presumably, it's pushing events to some sort of persistent layer. Uh, and then there's a bunch of custom code that sends to PagerDuty and email and probably Slack and all these other tight integrations that Prometheus is now has to manage. You know, we can move on to Kubedge. And in fact, they have another eventing bus system here. And it could be that MQTT is the, the absolute correct solution for them. Um, but you know, it brings questions like, do, do they have to manage that? Can I bring my own? Can I bring a different version? How tightly are those events? Who defines the schema? And if we move on to one, one final one, um, Falco, another great project, part of the CNCF. The, and I happen to know that the, the core of Falco is written in C++ and EPBF, and they have uh, uh, various outputs that they support in that structure, but they wanted to support more things like Slack and S3 and, uh, in fact, cloud events. And so they extended it with this thing called Falco Sidekick. It streams data from the gRPC server, and then it does some munching in a more friendly language, and this one's written in Go, hence the gopher. And, but they have the same integrations, right? Slack and S3 and email and who knows what. So eventing is everywhere. And many projects either produce or consume events, but a lot of those have very, very similar outputs, right? They, they're all sending to email or they're all sending to Slack. And I trust Falco to scrape the system D messages off of my, uh, off my nodes, but do I trust them to uh, you know, rotate my Slack credentials. It's not their job, right? It's, so the, these custom integrations are also everywhere, and my assertion is that they're very fragile. So, and in fact, in your own applications, as you're assembling these things together, you, you probably also want to send to Slack and email and all, all these other things. And so you then, again, have to duplicate all of that code and so, you know, 
if you are making these choices, will they scale to the, uh, what you need tomorrow? And not, so I'm going to coin a term, and I don't know if this is a real term or not, but it felt good when I wrote this slide. But I'm calling them island architectures, and I'm going to define it as a piece of technology that brings a very strong opinion about all of the underlying technologies that it wants to use. And if we're doing that a la carte, pick uh, projects off the CNCF board and using them to orchestrate and uh, architect our applications, we sometimes end up with these little islands of architectures that don't talk to each other. And this is cloud events, so the scope isn't gigantic, right? We're talking about eventing. Uh, is, there some, is there something we can do in this space, little, we as a community can do, that would uh, start to fix this problem just a little bit? So we have a solution, maybe. Or at least we have the, the north star of a solution. I'm going to walk through another example, kind of explaining similar architectures, but much more generic. So, so let's, let's go again, right? Um, what, what's the actual problem? The, the real problem is that we have these event producers, and because the event producers come from different uh, uh, selections off of that CNCF map, their schemas of their events are in different shapes, potentially even in uh, different formats, like this one produces XML events, and this one produces JSON events. And so there's no, there's no way for me to g generically ask a, a component like this event mediator that uh, ingresses the event, and then I write some custom code that inspects it, maybe decodes it halfway, and then decides, based on my custom logic, to send it to some individual message bus or channel or queue so that I have an event consumer that's uh, wanting to process that event. And it becomes a problem if I, if I add a new producer, and it, or the producer's been upgraded and it adds a new event, and I haven't updated the event mediator, but I did update the consumer, and I have to do this very complicated coordination thing. So, you know, we have these event producers. You probably have many of them in your, your systems. And they're glued together with this, uh, I'm calling it the event mediator, but you, it's, it's this little custom piece of logic that is trying to inspect it, and it's maybe different for every different, uh, kind of producer. And it's this custom necessary evil to be able to route things the right way. But what you really want to focus on is those event consumers, because that's where the work is actually happening. So if you, if you can't rely on some sort of common schema against all of your events, you have to write these, these routing configs, and they become part of your application and platform. And they have to be developed and maintained. And, and so what if we could define the event, but define it independent of the protocol? So uh, it, we can define the event at, independent of the shape of the event that's the actual payload. If we did that, we would be free to be able to choose the particular technology we're using to route the event. Uh, and that could be the, the protocol that's the persistence layer. You know, we we want to uh, save the event so we, m we make sure it gets delivered. Or it could be uh, the language that we are processing the event with. But often what happens is when you go to start a new project or you go to add a new piece, you have to make a hard choice that kind of sticks with the project forever unless you do a big refactor. And you're, you have to decide which of those persistent technologies we're going to use, which language we're going to use, what's the custom format of the internal event, or what's my event schema. And if you're a big organization, you better hope that it's at least a little consistent so that your, that router logic isn't uh, extremely difficult. So the, what, what Cloud Events is trying to do is uh, accept that you have um, the event payload, the occurrence, the, the weird shaped object that you're trying to send around. Uh, and Cloud Events defines you an envelope to put that in, right? Just like the mail. Uh, has a spot for the address and where it goes and the uh, postal, you, you adhere to that and then you sh shove your letter in. And to deliver that event, 
uh, the postperson doesn't open the envelope and read the letter and say, oh, this one is for grandma. I'm going to put it in grandma's box. No, it, they just look at the outside of the envelope and they don't have to look, right? So if we can wrap that event, we can treat everything as this, this cloud event object and a lot of the, the event mediator type objects become uh, generic and, and uh, off-the-shelf replaceable. So this is what we had. And if we introduce cloud events to the system for the inputs and the outputs, the, these custom routing components become configuration because we know how to ask the event, what are the features of you that I can route, make routing decisions on? And as we add things, we don't have to change the mediator except maybe update some configuration where we want that event to flow to this other place, right? So I'm going to take a pause. And so that's, that's, that's framing the technical point of wh where we are today with cloud events. We've defined this envelope. We can, uh, we can find other cloud event compatible components and just kind of drop them in. Um, but there's, there's more that we could do. And so I have a call to action to everyone that's uh, here today and watching the presentation. Um, if you produce a, any kind of event, make it a cloud event. Because if, uh, if, if, you're, if you're producing webhooks, we could take that and convert it to any other protocol and uh, route it to its wherever it wants to go with, with almost no code change on your side. It's adding some, some header if it's, if it's HTTP. If you're at the point where you have to make a choice, adopt cloud events internally, because eventually you're going to want to make webhooks too to uh, connect uh, another organization or another cloud. And it'd be a whole lot easier if the external format and the internal format are the same, this, this cloud event thing. And if you're integrating with things, ask that project to produce cloud events. Because if, uh, if you're not asking for the cloud event support, it, no one's going to listen and, and we're not going to get a nice world where we can do fancy things like maybe the Prometheus and the Falcos and my projects all produce events, but they ingress it into some of these off-the-shelf common components where I can provide my own persistence. And then if if Prometheus wants to provide me a, a, an excellent Slack integration that's listening for those events, they wire it up to that event bus that's an off-the-shelf component. This stuff doesn't exist. I think we have to make it. But uh, it starts by agreeing that the cloud events format is the, the right direction and something that's worthwhile so that we can have nice things and we can delegate some of this responsibility where you know a, a new CNCF project comes up and says, we are the Slack and email and uh, uh, alert manager and et cetera, kind of, uh, we know how to manage and rotate credentials and keep that stuff safe and push events. And uh, all you need to do is tell us the kinds of events that you would like to signal on so that we can produce those results. And then that frees the, the Prometheuses and the Falcos and the uh, your project and all like maybe 80% uh, of the CNCF landscape, uh, they don't have to do those integrations in their project and they don't have to do those maintenances because they can decouple themselves from those integrations. So that's, that's my wild pitch is the, you know, we're going to move to a bridged island architecture because at scale this makes sense. And yes, it is very simple to make some of these integrations locally and test it. But it doesn't scale when you go to production because there are other concerns. You know, not just the, the ease that it is to uh, do that integration, but you have to maintain it and you have to do the cert rotation and you have to keep up with the patches uh, from that component and et cetera, et cetera. You have to follow that upstream API if, if you're not actually, if you're not the Slack organization producing the component. So there's, there's overhead there that uh, all of these projects could avoid. Okay, so we're gonna go back into some of the um, more boring mechanics of cloud events. 
So, okay, we're gonna zoom way in, and I, I'm, I'm gonna try to answer the, how does this help me? It sounds like you're asking me to do more work. Well, let's say you're picking Kafka as a delivery mechanism for your eventing systems. You have your business logic that's meant to, you know, it, it creates, it does business work, it does, uh, you know, it creates some sort of object, and then that object is the occurrence of, the, like, the thing happened, like somebody logged in, or uh, a Visa card was charged. And you have this custom glue that takes that object and converts it into the correct format that uh, Kafka expects. And then you delegate that object down to the Kafka library, puts it on the Kafka uh, queue over the wire and networking, uh, and then it goes in reverse and the consumer side consumes it, right? But you have to maintain that custom glue part because it's part of your application. And so what the what Cloud Events has tried to do is uh, the community has been developing a bunch of SDKs in a bunch of different languages to help replace that custom shim with an SDK that you can use to leverage to adapt it to other protocols. So you don't have to write that shim anymore. You can if you want to, though, because you know the first artifact of the, uh, this working group has been specifications that define the, the bindings between, we call them bindings, uh, the bindings between the, the thing that, you know, your event, this thing, and the, the weird shape that Kafka ex expects, which is different than what Nats expects, and which is different than what the HTTP wants. And so the, the point of the Cloud Events library is, we got you. Whatever you configure with a protocol, you pass around your, your actual object, and we will help you create that protocol-specific shape and, and back out is the important part. And your business logic starts to just depend on the, uh, uh, the custom code. And yeah, okay, fine, yeah, it is the same picture, right? But the difference is you have to maintain that glue. I have to maintain that glue. I don't wanna help you. And there's those, you know, I type and, and work on the code. Our colleagues work on code and then it helps everybody. And so the, there's a scale factor. If you find a bug, you come and you help me fix it because I need some help. <laughs> but yeah, so you, know, you get to really focus on that business logic of producing and consuming. And this, this applies to uh, you know, those, that uh, selecting those CNCF projects too. You know, they're, in this case, the event consumer. And if they uh, leveraged uh, Cloud Events SDK, they would have the ability to kind of at runtime select different protocol libraries. And how neat would that be? It says, you know, I, okay, let's say Prometheus uses Kafka uh, internally. I don't know. I don't, I'm just guessing. Maybe they do. Um, but I don't have any Kafka instances in my cluster and I want to use Prometheus. So if if they had an integration like this, I could have in their configuration, no, 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 not Kafka, um, Today I want to use NATs. And it would just be a configuration on installation, and I, I get to wire in, I, I bring my own persistence layer. And it is sl slightly more work for them to integrate, but it's way less work for me to operate it. So what, is, what does a cloud event look like, literally? Um, I'm gonna show you HTTP, and there's other protocols, and they look sort of sim similar. Uh, but this is HTTP structured. There's, there's two forms of HTTP, and that's really because sometimes in some languages, it's much easier to deal with the entire event payload as a JSON object, because uh, maybe, you know, maybe it's not as uh, easy to inspect headers in JavaScript versus in Go, or in Python, or in, in whatever, pick your language. And, what they really want to just, just, I want to look at the, just the JSON part to implement my router. There's other protocols like uh, uh, NATS that just streams the JSON object. So it helps to have a JSON format. Uh, and this is what it looks like. So at the top level, there's some required attributes and there could be additional extensions with some rules. And then there's the data piece and there's some nuances there, but uh, you know, find me later and we'll talk about the nuances and so you, you know, your weird shape object gets shoved into the data piece. 
And so I just heard a question. Um, yeah, so if it's an image, it works too. But it's because an image doesn't fit into JSON normally. It gets base64 encoded, so any kind of data can get pushed into this data field with some rules. Uh, it, and you know we pay for a, a bigger size, but we get to send this binary data in binary mode in HTTP. All of those routing metadata, all the the you know right. So let's go back to why we're doing this, right? The, the reason we're doing this is because we want to have a consistent way to do routing decisions on events in uh, off-the-shelf components that connect producers and consumers of events, right? Because that was the friction point of why we can't adopt serverless so easy. So the weird shaped thing here is this, uh, the little, the green part, it's the data. That's the stuff that you made, it's weird. The blue stuff is what the serverless working group has created, and it's it's totally not weird. No, um, and it's, so we need some we need a little bit of metadata to figure out if it's actually a cloud event or not, and we need some hints to say what version of the cloud event spec you're following. So, uh, you know, we you have to have the version type, source, and ID, and there's some other fields that I can show in a second. Um, So there's some required fields. Like I said, uh, spec version, type, source, and ID. And then there's some optional ones that you can add that are standardized and specified by the spec, but you can add anything you want. So if you needed to uh, have some sort of custom logic and adding uh, extra attributes because that's what your application needs, go for it. There's some rules, but it's that's uh, intended. So, for example, uh, here's what a the GitHub binding would look like. And if there's anyone in Git from GitHub in the room, we should talk. Because how cool would it be? Actually, okay, I'm gonna pause. It's not the script, but I'm sorry. You know, okay. So when you're doing uh, GitHub webhook interactions. You know, it's kind of this two-phase thing where you get the payload, you have to uh, unmarshal it halfway and look at some type metadata and then l use this big lookup table and you get the real thing and then you unmarshal it again. And uh, the cloud event spec might help that because you start pushing some of that metadata up into the headers and you start getting to do routing of the webhooks. And I think they do do some of this too in the headers. but. Uh, you know, we also have a binding for, for what a GitHub webhook looks like in cloud events that we specify, and there's a couple others that are in our documentation. So, yeah. Okay, so you're sold. Awesome. Uh, and you're, I, oh, I just heard another question. Yes, uh, your language is likely supported. So, and if it's not, um, talk to us. Maybe you could help us make the new binding. All it takes is um, a bit of dedication and uh, reading some of the binding specs to be able to figure out how to take the natural object in that language and convert it to the protocol-specific uh, integration in that language. And there's a bunch of protocol bindings, too. I don't think this is all, because this list is uh, slightly out of date, but I, the following slide has all of them. Um, and so if it wasn't clear, I'm going to say it again. The, what a protocol binding does is it takes the, the concept of a cloud event with all of its routing metadata, and it converts it into the AMQP version of that thing. And then it also specifies how to take an instance of that AMQP version event and, and inspect it and convert it back to the protocolless version of, of the event. Right, and that's so. It's a it's a, a little bit of payment, but it, you decouple yourself from uh, all of these protocols because it can go in AMQP and and then you can go from AMQP to NATS and then NATS to Kafka and then out of Kafka over HTTP and you should have the same event because all of those hops should be lossless with a caveat. Here's the full list. There's, it's a lot, and it's growing every day, and I'm, I'm absolutely certain this is not the full list. Um, so if you're, if you're producing and consuming cloud events, let me know, and we'll get you on this list. 
Okay. So future updates. We have been working for a very long time on three new specs, the Discovery API, the Subscription API, and the Schema Registry. The Discovery API says, well, if you produce an event, please let's have a talk. And uh, what are the kinds of things that you produce? What are the sources? What are the attributes that I can filter on? Once you know what you can filter on, you can talk to the subscription API on that producer and say, I would like to subscribe to this subset of, of things, right? Because it's, it's great. You, if you're not producing events in your application, you, you should, but you also should try to uh, upstream those filters as high up the chain as possible because if I don't need the event, maybe you don't need to send it through all of the persistence layers, right? So the, the, the idea is that if we could standardize the subscription API, we could standardize the mechanism to do that filter propagation through big elaborate chains. And then as soon as somewhere down the chain someone's interested in that event, that also propagates up and the event starts flowing and we get interesting application uh, scenarios. And then uh, finally, there's a schema registry. You know, at the end of the day, this is about your weird shaped object in the inside. And so the schema registry provides a mechanism to describe the schema of what's inside the, the actual event because that's honestly what's important, right? The discovery and subscription APIs are about uh, being able to orchestrate flows of, of events between producers and consumers. But the schema registry is about maybe I could I know you produce this event and it has this kind of context. Maybe I could produce a function that just handles it. So the big, we've, we've had these for a while and you, you're probably saying, I saw this talk last year and you're, you're right. And it turns out that these three things are pretty tricky and we, um, one of the things we've been doing is uh, independently a bunch of people have been implementing the specs to just read through them and make sure it's clear. And the thing that we decided was there needs to be an offline mode because I would like to be able to point to at some repo that implements the generic discovery ser service or my, and there's a, a set of documents that describe exactly the ins and outs of the event. Maybe it has the schema registry offline documents and I can do a bunch of development uh, without having to actually interact with a running server somewhere. So. Uh, that was the feedback we're taking. We're trying to roll that into um, an updated spec, uh, but we're still very close to uh, doing an RC of these three specs. I, I, I bet um, in the next couple months we'll have an RC. So if you're interested in that too, we are looking for more people to go do that exercise of read the spec and implement it. They're not that complicated. Uh, we just want to make sure that we have the spec uh, concise and clear because you know, being a, a working group that's based in specs, if the spec doesn't translate to interoperable systems, we aren't doing a good job. So we, we need to get that uh, straightened out. So we need your help. And I have a few minutes for questions. Thanks for the great presentation. Um, I was wondering when I was working with Cloud Events uh, why you made the design decision that sometimes you put it in the payload, like the envelope, and sometimes it's um, part of the headers. For me, it was a more obvious choice to have it in the headers because it gives the, the flexibility based on infrastructure, whatever, making routing decisions, and also like based on request filters um, that you have without unmarshalling the whole object. Yes. Yes, so um, there are other eventing systems that natively speak JSON internally. And so it would be expensive to try to figure out how to convert you know, the, a JSON thing into a non-JSON thing and back at it. And so the, the answer is that there are a lot of systems that do just look at JSON. And they make routing decisions based on a very uh, simple scan of the, the schema 
and they do that one level on Marshall. They have optimized it to do that. Um, there are other ones that don't want to modify the, the event payload at all. And so we have structured mode to support the, the native JSON. Like, I think all of Amazon's just JSON, right? There's, they don't really use headers to do this kind of thing. But there are other systems like uh, GitHub Webhook where we don't really want to wrap their payload to convert it to a cloud event. And so adding headers is a very low bar of entry uh, way to get that, this cloud event metadata to do routing. And the cool thing is that you can convert them in and out of structured or, or uh, binary mode with, with uh, uh, a little bit of processing, but no loss. But yeah, I also prefer the binary mode because it, it's, it's a bit cheaper. Thanks. When I produce a message to a Kafka, for example, so I want to serialize the message with a protobuf for Avro or something like that. How it's come uh, to implicate if I use cloud event? When when I serialize the the message before the cloud event, the in the cloud event himself, uh, that's it. Yeah, um, we we do have an Avro binding that. Uh, helps address some of that. And we, we also have a proto binding, but uh, if it's already been serialized, it, it uh, complicates th matters. So it's, that's kind of, that's, that's what I'm hoping to get across, is that it'd be easier if upstream the event was produced as a cloud event versus needing to figure it out later. Is but that, uh, also if the event is, also, if the event is produced by cloud event, so I want a structure to to my event. Uh, the event is a I don't know it's it's class of human, so something like that. The protobuf give me the class himself. If if the it's cloud event, I don't have uh, the fields that I uh -huh. I need. You, you understand what I mean? Yeah. Well, if it's not working, let's talk and let's get it fixed. Because. Okay. I think that's the point, is that it's a useful thing that people actually use. Thanks. Uh, hi, I would like to ask that uh, that glue between the protocol and cloud events library, if the protocol somehow changes, uh, how, is there some collaboration between like those um, protocol specific applications and uh, cloud events team or something like that that they are notifying you or something like that um, there hasn't there hasn't been direct communication between you know uh, libraries that are doing that. although I, there's an exception so you know, we're just another integrator with those libraries. And the, the, the hope is that we open source that work and uh, we, we accept contributions from people that are working with it and finding bugs. And if the upstream thing changes or needs some update, it comes down and we can upgrade that in the SDKs and then that trickles out to everybody else that's depending on those, kind of um, bearing the load of, of integrations. Uh, a slightly other direction is um, we did uh, chat with the open telemetry folks a bunch, and the problem was if you're sending a cloud event as a producer of the cloud event and the consumer, you kind of want to see the whole chain. But the perspective of open telemetry was, well, if if the protocol switches, it's a different trace. But what I really want to see is HTTP to NATs to HTTP to a producer or a consumer. And getting that whole trace wired up uh, required a new field that got added to uh, open telemetry or open tracing. And now you can get traces that span protocols, which is really neat. Um, coming from a perspective of a developer who's building you know, applications that produce events or application that consumes events, I'm trying to understand the value, because you, you had touched earlier, because um, if the thing inside the cloud event changes, I have to redeploy both anyway. So 
uh, and um, in, in, a, in an architecture like that, I'm sort of like all the routing stuff, I'm relying on some sort of a messaging system, right? So yep. I don't play in that space. So I'm, I'm trying to understand some, you know, where would, you know, where would this fit in? Uh, is it really the platform, the folks that are running the platform that has the responsibility of making sure the event gets to where it needs to? They're the ones, that's what I'm thinking, but I wanted to kind of hear from you. Yeah. Uh, so, so the way I like to try to answer this question tends to be the, so as a developer, I want to, I want to write that Slack, that tight Slack integration that I, I know that I'm listening to this thing and, I, and there's several events that I'm interested in and they cause other things. Uh, but in production, it's, it's a Kafka and it's very expensive. And I want to be able to test it in QA. And if my function that's, or my service is, is tightly bound to Kafka, the way I have to integrate, uh, like unit test that, is by standing up fake Kafka servers and, and pushing data through. Uh, and if I want to do an integration test, I have to have like a real Kafka cluster and figure out how to tear that up and down and uh, run those tests through it. But if I supported the, this idea of, well, I could shim it and I want to operate on the cloud event, not the, the Kafka uh, event, then I can switch my protocol inside my QA environments or my uh, CI environments to something that's you know, cheap and cheerful, maybe it doesn't have persistence, but in production it's rock hard and has persistence until, uh, for, for all of time or, or whatever. And so I, I think not having to think about that as a developer is the hope, but it's also beyond the scope of what Cloud Events is but because Cloud Events is trying to define this common shape, we enable other, uh, there's a few other um, groups that are building solutions like that, that you can kind of replace the middle piece. One other question. Um, it does feel like soap. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Well, it's, <laughs> um, so the, the Cloud Events group has been very specific about not defining the runtime yet, and so, you know, if you look at the repo, it's, it's a specification that describes uh, what should be available to route on and then a bunch of specifications that define, you know, generic thing to protocol specific thing and back. And that's, that's kind of the extent right now versus uh, runtime characteristics that, you know, others like Knative Eventing or um, Argo have kind of expanded on because they needed a runtime contract. And Cloud Events is not providing that. The, the role of Cloud Events is to take the thing that was a protocol specific thing and turn it into something that's generic and useful so that you don't have to worry about the, that protocol piece. Uh, hi, yeah, quick one. So you mentioned the discovery in the subscription API, the spec yeah. that you're working on, and you mentioned that um, some, some groups are trying to implement that. Um, so can you give some examples of the projects that are happening in that space? Oh, um, so we, um, we are internally to the working group, we're looking for volunteers to read the specs and produce an implementation. So before we go and provide an SDK in a bunch of languages, we just wanna make sure that the spec reads and produces a compatible, a compatible result with other implementations of the same spec. So uh, there's no, there's no like commercially available thing, although the schema registry is, um, I, you can interact with the beta version on Azure, I think. And, and for the other stuff, I'm just looking to see some concrete examples. It oh, doesn't matter if it's ready yes. or not, right? Ping me in the Cloud Events, uh, the Cloud Events room in the CNCF Slack, and I'll send you some repos. Cool. We've, awesome. we've very specifically been trying to make um, a, a several implementations in several languages to, to make sure that the spec translates into working interoperable code. Because if it doesn't, it's, there's no point. Cool. And that's, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you.